Welcome to the RAD site webinar. We will be getting started in 30 seconds. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining RADSITE's webinar, Imaging Experts on the Latest Trends Shaping Radiology. Before we begin, I would like to go over a few housekeeping items. Today's presentation will be recorded, and an email containing the link will be sent to all registered participants within 24 hours. To minimize noise and distraction, all attendee phones have been muted. However, if you have a question or a comment during the presentation, we encourage you to submit it using the chat box section on the lower right side of your, the webinar portal. We will do our best to address all comments at the end of the presentation. I will now turn the presentation over to our moderator, Gary Carneal, President and CEO of RADSITE. Thank you, Julie, and welcome everybody to today's webinar entitled Imaging Experts on the Latest Trends Shaping Radiology. And I must admit, I'm really thrilled about the three speakers we have this afternoon and can't wait to hear what they have to say regarding the different issues that I'll mention in a moment. Um, but we have uh, really three exciting presentations. Uh, we're going to begin to set the stage with um, talking a little bit about what payers are looking for in terms of their imaging networks. And as you'll learn in a moment, is that represents two decades plus worth of work. And of course, the purchasers and payers of uh, healthcare are always a very important stakeholder group to make sure we understand what they're thinking about in terms of quality and efficiency and patient safety. Then we're going to take a look forward a little bit and looking at uh, the potential future of imaging related to virtual and augmented reality and its role in diagnostic and interventional radiology. And then we're gonna look at uh, kind of the hidden cost of poor image quality and the relationship between image quality and radiation dose show showcasing that there's a lot more uh, work to be done. You know, I, and my LinkedIn profile reminded me I've been working with RADSITE uh, for eight years. Um, and uh, as a quick aside, RADSITE's been an independent uh, company for um, over five years, but our first speaker, Jimmy Long, who's the Humanist Director of National Contracting, is actually one of the initial founders of Bradside, I think, uh, and Jimmy can correct me if I'm wrong, about 23 years ago. So he has an incredible background. He's going to talk a little bit about the payer priorities, but he's been involved with Humana on direct measurable strategic initiatives to manage Humana's utilization management and unit costs for radiology, physical therapy, chiropractic and other specialty services. And he's also worked with potentially, um, he's worked with quality and saving opportunities for other ancillary uh, services. Um, and has really led the national implementation of for over 4 million member, uh, Humana members in terms of a number of radiology initiatives, which he's gonna talk about. A lot of that has been offered early on through RADSITE. And uh, he's led the proce uh, process to re-engineer and to create a scalable uh, model for, um, again, lots of different specialty services that Humana offers through their networks. So he's going to talk about pa payer initiatives. Our second speaker, uh, Dr. Elliot Siegel, is an internationally recognized radiologist who serves as a professor and vice chair at the University of Maryland School of Medicine. Department of Diagnostic Radiology, as well as Chief Radiology and Nuclear Medicine for the VA, Maryland Healthcare System. He also serves as the chair of RADSITE Standards Committee, and he has helped oversee and promote the integrity of all the quality-based programs and research initiatives for RADSITE. And he also got, provides guidance for RADSITE's accreditation programs and internal quality improvement initiatives. He's a nationally known author, a speaker, and has been on the uh, forefront of a lot of technology advancements, which he'll talk about. So he's going to address today aspects related to the virtual and augmented reality of um, imaging. And then finally, but not least, we have Dr. Bruce Reiner, who has served uh, serves as the chief medical officer for RADSITE 
and he's also a nationally recognized expert in clinical radiology. He is known for his research, uh, publications, and inventions. Uh, his experience spans more than three decades, includes um, both academic, government, and private practice settings. He has um, done, he's published over 100 articles. Uh, he has dozens of patents on some of his ideas related to medical quality, safety, data mining, reporting, communications. And he's really a thinker, thinking about how we can improve the accretion process and, uh, and generate a new quality and safety standards. So he'll be talking a little bit more about really why we shouldn't just um, rest with the current system because there are hidden costs of poor image quality and there's an opportunity to kind of move the ball forward. So I'm thrilled to get um, the speakers going. Julie, if you can just move to the um, RAT site slide. So just a little background on RAT site. Um, uh, next slide, please. Yeah. So again, RAT site's been around since 2005. Uh, we've been recognized by um, uh, CMS uh, since 2013 for our MIPA accretion program, but throughout our, um, ten, our existence, we've always tried to promote the highest quality standards in safety and medical imaging. Uh, we have our MIPA accretion standards uh, focus on enhancing patient safety, implementing effective national standards, and innovating and establishing new ways to measure quality and outcomes. And I love the fact that through our volunteer-based committee system, both represented by the standards committee and the accreditation committee, along with the board, that we're working together as a community to really rethink some of the ways that we've been benchmarking image quality and to work with CMS and others. So if you want to learn more about RADSite, just jump on our website at www.radsitequality.com and you can learn more about us. So I think it's uh, appropriate that we turn it over to Jimmy Long now to talk a little bit about payer initiatives and he can tell you a little bit about the history of RADSite and some of the things that he's worked on during his 23-year uh, career at Humana. Jimmy. Thank you, Gary. Um, thank you for inviting me today. Um, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about uh, what we've done from a certification and a network perspective from a, and kind of as a payer, you know, what we're looking for from our imaging network. So, you know, one of the things, you know, we're looking for is, is making sure that there's a, that we have a network certification. So we kind of started a certification, starting with that principle in mind. So back in 2005, um, I partnered with folks to kind of, to bring uh, a pro rad site to life. And, and when we, when we were looking at it, we wanted to make sure that uh, a, a lot of times when as more and more imaging moved into an outpatient setting and, and away from the hospital, some of the uh, the governance and oversight that a hospital organization gives were 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 undefined. So so we wanted to make in the in the outpatient setting, so um, a non-hospital outpatient setting. So we wanted to make sure, from an equipment standpoint, from a policy standpoint. And from a personnel standpoint, the, around imaging at, at the individual modality level, that all of those areas were being considered, and that all of those items were were being taken into account to make sure that our network or our individual facilities would be classified from a, a quality perspective. So, and you know, kind of why we wanted to do that, you know, the, the kind of in short was. We know that when a good image in a in an image is supposed to be done, that you get an accurate diagnosis more quickly, and then move into a successful treatment plan at a more rapid pace. So, so that was kind of what was uh, behind what we were looking for. So, so we started down the path, and you know some of it, you know, we didn't really know everything that we'd be able to do with it because, again, this was back in 2005. So we started collecting a lot of information, you know, around, you know, what, what's the magnet strength of the the MRI and are the folks that are operating the MI of the MRI, have they been trained? Do they have the right quality reports that are being run? Or from a CT perspective, you know, do they – are they administering uh, pediatric doses? Do, are the folks doing the interpretation qualified to do it? 
what how many slices are is this the the CT that you're using. So we started looking at all of those things and, and some of the stuff at the time that we started looking, we didn't even know how we would use some of the information. But you know, from a CT perspective, as uh, low dose for low dose CT for lung cancer screening became the uh, the ideal way to, to do lung cancer screening, we knew at that point in our network who had that type of equipment, which was really beneficial for us to be able to identify those types of facilities in order to direct our patient, our members to those areas. So um, those are some of the things that we were looking for and making sure that we had certification on all of our equipment. And, and we had an understanding of all the different types of equipment that were being used within each one of the facilities. And then how did we kind of use that? If we go to the next slide, you know, it kind of fit into a, a, a broader view of how we, we look at the uh, tracking the, the, the episode of care within imaging. So we, we, we put together several different programs and, and a lot of them centered around the quality certification of the facility as well as the staff that would be performing the imaging. But from a health plan perspective, we wanted to make sure that a, a test was medically necessary. And when we talk about uh, high-tech imaging like CTs, MR, and PET scans, so we put in a program that would talk about the medical appropriateness of the test. So to make sure that the, the test that we, was being rendered was, there was evidence behind that it was the right thing to do. Um, and so we put that program in in conjunction with Rad Site back in uh, 2005, and we we then used the the Rad Site information to make sure that the facilities that it was being directed toward uh, met all the qualifications that um, in order to administer a quality image, so so that they would bring forth a quality image. So at that point, um, we had a test that we knew was medically necessary. We knew that the folks that were rendering the test had the technical expertise and were keeping the equipment upgraded to administer the test. Um, but then there was still one piece that was missing, and it was making sure that the, the person that was doing the interpretation had the qualifications to do so. So we kind of continued to expand the program and understanding the interpretation capabilities of the personnel that were uh, interpreting the image. And so th then when we put all of those programs together, we felt like we had a medically necessary procedure that was being rendered on an appropriate uh, machine by technically proficient individuals. And then the person who did the interpretation had an understanding of what they were interpreting in order to launch into the most appropriate treatment plan. So, so, and on top of all of that, then we would put together some audit tools to make sure that we were not seeing outliers from a performance standpoint as to uh, the facilities that were rendering the test. So we would kind of look at not only just the image, but the audit process would look at the overall care for that member and and, and how it looked when they went to X facility versus Y facility. So that was kind of from a episode perspective, what Humana did to look at um, overall from a imaging perspective. Um, and then if we go, so that was kind of what we were doing. And then if you go to the next slide, then we started, um, so then we started doing a little bit more uh, taking the uh, direct oh, back one going and, and tracking some of the key performance benchmarks and you know then instead of just initially in 2005 when we started it was a voluntary program then we started requiring folks to go through the certification program and and now we're actually using that information to to guide test to our optimal providers um, and at the so the right place of treatment as well as kind of the when 
when everything else is equal from an efficacy standpoint and a quality standpoint, then making sure we're getting to the right priced uh, procedure as well. So those were the, some of the things that we looked at from an imaging perspective. So, you know, just kind of a recap, making sure it's medically necessary, making sure it's going to a quality facility that has the right equipment that they continue to keep upgraded, uh, and then making sure they have quality and safety, uh, things like medic, like radiation officers in place when they're uh, using equipment that delivers radiation, and then making sure that the personnel doing the interpretation are, are qualified to do so. And so then when all of those things are equal, th then we look at, at price and using all those things together, guide test to the optimal location. So those are the types of things from a health plan perspective that we look at and have looked at historically as it relates to the type of imaging network that we're looking for, whether it's hospital outpatient image rendered by a physician within their office or freestanding imaging center. So those are the types of things that, that we have looked at. And with that, um, I know there's going to be question and answers at the end, but then I was going to turn it over to uh, my colleague, Elliot Siegel, Dr. Siegel, to, to talk about the next section during the webinar. And if, if I could just jump in, Jimmy, thank you for that overview. I think, you know, you provide a framework that really provides the catalyst for a lot of the work that uh, Dr. Siegel and Dr. Reiner are talking about. I have a quick question for you just kind of as an intermediate step. So under the auspices of a medical necessity or appropriateness determination, a payer has overseen a lot of the uh, elements of, you know, uh, an image uh, study for a patient. And I guess the question is, how do you under, how do you, you, you can have the certification and creation program you're recognizing, but how did you, how do you in the past, you know, process when there's a really old piece of equipment or there's something really new that's just coming on the market or in cases where you have, for example, a non-radiologist doing interpretations, how do you, because that's a, you know, that's a big kind of a world out there. So how do you kind of bring that into kind of what uh, Humana determines as the best practice or in the best interest of the patient and perhaps the practicing provider as well? Yeah, so um, there's there's a few different questions with, within that, Gary. So, you know, kind of starting with the one from an old equipment that we find outdated, um, as an example, um, ultrasounds that are over 10 years old, um, uh, we, we find them to be substandard. So for an ultrasound that is over, an, old, an old ultrasound piece of equipment that is over 10 years old that we identify at a facility, we will no longer reimburse for a test run on that machine. So, so we, we block reimbursement and we let the provider know that, that we, we feel that that's a substandard piece of equipment and that we, we, we can't reimburse for that any longer. So that's how we handle, you know, kind of outdated equipment or, or non-upgraded equipment. From a interpretation standpoint, um, we, we kind of put something in place that would say, um, kind of what you learn during your medical residency. As an example, um, uh, um, internal medicine physician has a, a great degree of competency of interpreting uh, ultrasounds of the extremity. They didn't have as much training during their medical residency to, to interpret ultrasound of the core body. So our default is we set it up where an internal medicine would not be reimbursed for core body ultrasound unless they're able to demonstrate for us a competency through either they show us a number of images that they've done interpretation on already or that they've had other courses beyond their medical training that would that would give them the competency to to do that type of interpretation so i hope that answers your questions gary absolutely thank you so you know in some respects you're modifying behavior as you deem appropriate based on reimbursement with some due process to make sure that there's a communication link with the uh, you know provider whether it's related to the age of equipment or 
uh, the scope of interpretation based on you know the specifics to what the provider's experience or training is. Absolutely. Okay, great. Well, let's move on. So thank you. I think uh, Jimmy's done a great job in kind of laying the framework and giving us a perspective as to what's driven a lot of uh, imaging practice through public and private pair initiatives. So uh, Elliot, why don't you talk to us a little bit about where the future is heading in terms of uh, imaging and all this exciting stuff that you're about to talk about. <laughs> sure. I'm delighted to. And, and thanks, Jimmy uh, and Gary also. Um, Jimmy talked about quality and um, talked a little bit about quality of the image acquisition and of the interpretation. One area that um, I've paid a lot of attention to during my career has been um, the quality of the uh, monitors and displays. And so I just want to talk a little bit about the continuing evolution of radiology monitors and also where we're going in the future with regard to virtual and augmented reality. And so for many years during my career, after you know we ended up uh, making the transition from uh, film to a, a digital operation uh, many years ago, um, we've constantly been looking for what does represent the uh, ultimate display. And uh, some of the things that we've looked at are what are characteristics of the ideal uh, monitor that would be utilized by a radiologist or, or by a clinician. And uh, I helped to write um, some of the standards that are in use today for monitors, and it's a question that I get asked frequently. Um, one of the things that we want to look for is resolution. If you have a chest radiograph that has a 2000 by 2500 uh, pixel resolution, um, then you want to have a monitor that's able to uh, display that. You want contrast resolution that's high enough to differentiate between the deepest blacks and the brightest whites. As far as uh, brightness, um, I believe that um, a monitor that you're using for medical imaging in general should be uh, 400 candela per meter squared um, or greater and ideally um, 500 candela uh, per meter squared. Um, also, I think in the future, many of us are interested in the potential for lightweight or even portable monitor systems. And there's been a fair amount of discussion about um, smartphones and tablets and what types of studies under what conditions might be able to utilize those. Um, we've done a fair amount of work also looking at um, the number of monitors. Is two monitors enough? Is one enough? Uh, some people have advocated um, more than four, as many as uh, six to eight. And is there the potential to be able to, in the future, um, switch over to a wearable monitor um, that might be able to even do uh, eye tracking? And so uh, this is an example of uh, some uh, research that we did looking at an eight monitor display. And of course, the advantage of that is the potential to be able to have many historic studies and many different modalities all up on the screen at the um, at the same time. The problem, of course, with that is um, it takes up a fair amount of real estate. It's uh, fairly expensive, although the cost of monitors is going down uh, precipitously. Um, but also, it can be a, a bit unwieldy, and it also um, requires a fair amount of space. And so, um, as we've looked at that solution, looking at you know how does one create an ergonomic workstation and an ergonomic chair. We've also um, started to wonder about, would it be possible, rather than having physical or actual monitors, to be able to create the equivalent of virtual monitors? And if we did, what might that look like? And um, so it started to um, encourage us to look at virtual reality and augmented reality. And in many ways, they really represent a continuum between virtual reality, which represents um, a completely controlled, self-contained universe where you put on glasses and essentially everything that you see that's displayed is brought to you by the glasses. And at the other end, the right end of the spectrum, uh, essentially you head toward um, reality where you have the ability to see everything that's going on as we normally do in real life, but to superimpose additional things that um, are um, placed in your visual field on top of what you see as a reality. And uh, so we've looked at quite a few different technologies um, with regard to virtual reality. Um, the Oculus Rift and the HTC Vive are really good examples of that. 
Again, these are purely simulations. They block out the user's view of the real world, so it can put you pretty much in any space or environment, but you're not seeing your own office, you're not seeing any of the other things. Um, so one could use VR technologies um, to be able to simulate one or more monitors, but our preference is more heading in the direction of um, augmented reality. This is a specific um, optical head-mounted uh, display, the HTC Vive, that's been available since April of 2016. It's tethered to a PC and it's about $900 a, a set. It's mainly used for games and education. The price of these virtual reality um, systems is going down and this is a uh, system with a LCD display and resolution that's 2560 by 1440, which is um, really acceptable for many, if not most, radiology type of applications as far as resolution. And its price is just below $200. And um, it, again, is a complete virtual reality um, setup. So you're not really seeing anything in the real world or in your own space. Then we move to things such as Google Glass, which um, I would uh, categorize as space agnostic augmented reality. And what that means is that um, you've got something that is a heads-up display that is displaying on top of your reality. So it displays additional information, maybe like the lines that you see when you're parking your car, or maybe information as you're walking around um, with a device such as Google Glass, but it doesn't really redefine or put things in space um, in such a way that they appear to be real and appear to be physical. So mainly this is used for superimposition of information or data over um, what you're seeing with glasses. And um, those um, units have been around since 2013. They were discontinued in January of 2015 by Google, but there are a number of different um, examples of things in that category. And I think Google is reinstituting its Google Glass with a more sophisticated version. Then after that comes um, what I, we would call space cognizant augmented reality, which I think is really the most sophisticated way and probably the most realistic for radiology departments. And probably the prototypic example of this is the Microsoft HoloLens, which we've done a fair amount of research with. What that does is it allows you within your own space, say your office, to be able to put whatever objects that you want to. And you can actually physically walk around and see details of the front, back, side, top, and bottom of whatever object that you put in the field. And so it gives one a tremendous amount of potential, whether you're in the reading room, in the um, interventional radiology suite, or in the operating room, to be able to put um, image information um, in a way that you really can't um, in any other way. And so um, there are many different consumer uses of these augmented reality displays in 3D, CAD, engineering, manufacturing, video games, and even uh, virtual tourism. Um, also, it's being leveraged in many different industries like engineering, military, aerospace, entertainment, construction, communication, and of course, we're going to focus on uh, healthcare applications. There are a number of companies that are already doing really interesting applications, whether it's being able to do um, transmission of images from one operating room to a remote location, whether it's um, making a child feel comfortable um, in an environment such as an MR environment or an operative environment and being able to be immersed while in that environment with um, something that would be comforting and, and, and take them sort of away from whatever the uh, procedure is um, so that they'd be able to feel calm and comfortable. Um, or even being able to uh, do um, remote diagnosis by having a healthcare provider um, uh, wear these glasses and have somebody who's an expert at a remote location be able to uh, see what that provider sees. And so um, we've also looked at the potential to be able to utilize it um, in interactive uh, operative type procedures or interventional radiology procedures. And uh, we'll talk about that in just a moment. The other thing that many, many of you know is that there have been many applications um, of 3D printing or 3D modeling. And what's really interesting is that many of the advantages of being able to create a 3D model are ones that you can get in an augmented or virtual reality environment where you can 
actually create on the fly a, a 3D object that you can walk around and inspect um, in a way that um, you can create almost instantaneously, you know, very inexpensively in comparison to waiting for a, a 3D model to print. So for all the applications for 3D printing, one can also use um, AR or VR. And so there are quite a few applications in both diagnostic and interventional radiology. One of the um, basic um, interesting applications is as a substitute for traditional um, workstations. And so there's the potential to be able to take um, traditional displays such as these and putting on augmented reality glasses, um, being able to create a monitor pretty much anywhere you want to put it. And so we've done some research looking at taking an image from a PAC system or advanced visualization system and being able to create as many monitors as you want in your environment. So imagine in your office, you could have images anywhere on the walls or on a desk or on a floating display. All of those would appear real to you as you're wearing these augmented reality glasses and you'd be able to essentially um, put images up and arrange them on any number of monitors that you wanted to set up with augmented reality. Um, in many ways, the ability to be able to render 3D images um, real time um, in a 3D space and be able to move and walk around those could give one a better um, ability to be able to understand 3D relationships. And so uh, there have been some really amazing examples where you could take um, a, a piece of anatomy and make it you know, almost room-sized and be able to walk around and inspect it. And so with regard to pre-surgical planning, um, many, many of us are using 3D printed models prior to that, but one could create the equivalent of that with augmented reality and be able to interact with the data in a way that you could never do with a physical printed model, but you can have the equivalent of many printed models um, with an augmented reality setup where you could dynamically um, change the view that you have, which you can't really do um, when printing 3D. Uh, with regard to um, interventional type procedures, the potential to be able to have augmented reality where one could actually um, do a procedure, watch the needle as it was um, being guided um, by an ultrasound um, system, but being able to ex look just at the patient and not have to look away at an ultrasound monitor is another really interesting application of uh, augmented reality. And so um, we've experimented with doing it with ultrasound guided procedures and it really is satisfying to be able to stay focused on the patient, focused on the area of biopsy, and be able to see the images without having to turn around and look at a, um, at a monitor. And also, um, there are many other different types of implications for augmented reality during procedures, sterile control using voice or gesture commands, and being able to constantly see um, what's going on with the imaging while being able to focus on the um, patient. Um, there are many other implications for um, guided interventions where one has the capability of being able to do, say, a CT scan um, and then be able to superimpose the CT scan, as you see here, for an image-guided procedure. Imagine doing a uh, um, spine-related procedure where you can actually have what appears to be a CT or MRI of the spine projected over the patient as you're doing the procedure real time moving as the uh, patient does. So part of the interventional holy grail is actually the ability to have superimposition of cross-sectional studies while one is doing a surgical procedure um, with or without fluoroscopy and have it move as the patient moves. So there is further work that's needed as far as figuring out how good is good enough for being able to um, know what the resolution that's required, what are the frame rate that's required to be able to um, have this real-time image guidance, whether it's for interventional procedures or diagnostic radiology procedures. One thing's for sure, though, and that is investment in VR and AR is going to be primarily driven by consumer devices. Um, and, you know, the market is expected to exceed $100 billion within the next uh, a year or so. Um, and so it's a really fast-growing industry with tremendous developments and lots of investment by um, uh, many of the uh, largest uh, technology um, companies. So 
Um, with regard to diagnostic radiology, we talked about traditional displays and a supplement to those, a novel multi-monitor workstation, intuitive ways to visualize 3D relationships, and more cost-effective and more detailed surgical planning with 3D modeling. With image-guided intervention, there's the capability of being able to do simulation training, to be able to keep your eye on the patient and on the procedure, um, and have the imaging from ultrasound or another modality superimposed um, on your visual field, and the ability to be able to remotely record and share what you're doing. So a surgeon would be able to do training or consultation with potentially another surgeon in another location, for example, and um, also sterile display of interprocedural data. But you know, there's some questions in diagnostic radiology. Can these devices replace existing PAX workstations? Will people have issues wearing these for prolonged periods of time? Um, you know, will there be a, an issue with you know nausea or or kind of a, a sense of dizziness that some people experience wearing um, a subset of these VR and AR systems? And so, as time goes on, um, for entertainment purposes and for um, military applications and others, the technology with regard to display ergonomics and processing has been getting far better. Can these devices provide a safer, more efficient way to perform image-guided intervention? Our initial experience at the University of Maryland says absolutely yes, they can, but that needs to be validated by additional research and additional clinical trials. So um, I believe that VR and AR demonstrate the next paradigm as we've moved from um, CRT monitors and now to LED or OLED and more advanced displays. I think it's going to be a continuum where we begin to see more and more of our images that are um, utilizing VR and AR technologies. They've got exciting applications, but um, clearly more work needs to be done to be able to test and, uh, and validate these systems. So thank you very much for your attention, and it's my pleasure and privilege to uh, introduce our next um, uh, speaker, the distinguished Dr. Uh, Reiner, who is uh, RADSITE's Chief Medical Officer. And, and just real quickly, if you don't mind, uh, Dr. Siegel, um, I'm just struck with the parallel earlier on, earlier in your career when you were one of the first radiologists in the uh, world to move from film to digital. And here we are with uh, VR, AR, 3D modeling. You had a slide before it says how good is good enough. So what, based on the lessons learned uh, when that happened, what, 25 years ago, when people said, you know, there was some skepticism about moving from film to digital. What what lessons from that experience can we apply to here? In other words, at what sure, point? Sure, I understand. How, how, yeah, go ahead. So I, I think a couple of things apply. One is that when we first, when we created the world's first filmless radiology department, the monitors we used were these really large CRT monitors that got really hot during the summer. They only lasted a few months before they had to be replaced when they were in continuous use. So I think the first lesson is don't judge the technology um, overall by some of the earliest impl uh, implementations. I think that Google Glass and the HoloLens are really early prototypes of much more comfortable systems that will be associated with higher frame rates, less lag, and I think uh, you know, you'll know you have a lot um, fewer of these side effects that are associated with it. And um, I think that the other lesson that's really important is that it takes a long, a good deal of time for people to start getting used to changes. You know, in reading from a film-based environment on computer monitors, we started out with the radiologist thinking of the monitors as though they were film. So for cross-sectional studies like CT and MR, instead of having the images stacked on top of each other, which is what all of our practitioners do now, the radiologists continue to want to work as though the images were um, film and so they just took the images and they wrote them on the monitor as though they were film without stacking them together in say a cine mode and so one thing that we have to be aware of is even when the technologies change it takes a good deal of time before radiologists and other healthcare practitioners actually start feeling comfortable with the technology so it may be that even when we have AR and can put monitors absolutely everywhere for some period of time radiologists wearing those AR or VR systems may try and simulate what they're used to with the two monitors or four monitor setups um, rather than taking advantage of a much more out of the box approach to it. And I think we just need to be patient with that and we need to do a fair amount of training. So 
I think you're absolutely right. There are many um, analogies as we ended up switching from analog film to digital. And as we switch from digital physical monitors to more virtual or non-physical monitors, I think many of the lessons learned will apply also. So thanks for the question, Gary. Great. Thanks, Dr. Siegel. Well, Dr. Reiner, I think this is a perfect uh, cue for you to talk because since you're a practicing teleradiologist as well, you see the good, the bad, and the ugly as well. So why don't you talk a little bit about you know, some of the challenges with poor image quality and what we can do to kind of get it right. Great. Thanks so much, Gary. Thanks, Elliot. Julie, next slide. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, the area of hidden costs associated with uh, quality deficiencies. And before I do that, I want to talk about the fact that, as Elliot kind of alluded to in his talk, that we're, we're in a practice environment where there's constant change. Uh, and we see this a lot in all areas of medicine. In years past, when we talk about selecting an imaging provider, it was largely left to the discretion of the referring physician and was really based upon personal relationships and matters of convenience. And this is really a reflection of the traditional concept, which we know as paternalistic medicine, where patients would largely defer all their healthcare decision making to the clinical providers with the proviso that they had superior knowledge. And the irony is, is that many of these clinical providers, when they were selecting imaging providers, had very little knowledge relating to the individual imaging quality and safety components of the uh, provider practice. And that often resulted in a relative lack of provider accountability. And the examples that I always use is, you know, a, a general practitioner might refer to a radiologist that he, he plays basketball with on Wednesdays at the YMCA, where they might refer to an imaging provider because the imaging provider basically delivers cookies to their office once every month. And that's, it might sound silly, but it's very simplistic in terms of how uh, clinicians would actually select imaging providers. It was not really based on factual data, but more on relationships. Next slide. So the paternalistic medicine concept has recently been replaced by patient empowerment. And as we all know, patient empowerment is when the patients actually take a proactive role in their own healthcare decision making. And to a large extent, probably the primary driver of uh, patient empowerment has been the internet because patients now have instantaneous access to all different types of medical data and educational resources. But along with the internet, uh, a big driver of patient empowerment is going to be in the near future, big data. And when we think of big data medicine, we typically think of things like medical genomics uh, and pharmaceuticals. But in reality, big data has a lot of applications in radiology as well. And it's when we utilize large medical imaging data repositories for a series of analytics, best practice standards, and personalized medicine. Next slide. An additional force of change, uh, unfortunately, has been economic. Uh, and the problem with economics is when it's used in the wrong way, it can actually be detrimental. And I think all of us experienced uh, probably in the five to 10 years previously a lot of managed care and capitation. And in this situation, the increased emphasis was on service provider costs. The problem with the cost-based referral model is that economics take precedence over quality. And instead of basically promoting an environment of survival of the fittest, we tend to commoditize the imaging providers and create an environment of survival of the cheapest. So what I'm gonna basically uh, suggest to you is that the ideal model we utilize objective and reproducible data, the kind of what we want to achieve through big data analytics, and drive the decision-making process, taking into account multiple outcome variables that would include cost, patient safety, quality, as well as timeliness. Next slide. So I want to take a cost-benefit analysis of medical imaging, but I want to do it in a slightly different way than we traditionally think of. We typically tend to think of medical imaging as a single all-inclusive process. We think of basically radiology basically largely defined by the radiology report, which is the end product. But in reality, when we look at medical imaging, it's actually a well choreographed chain of 16 individual steps that they actually begin at the time of the exam order and end at the time of the communication results. These individual and collective 16 steps really define the relative success or failure of imaging deliverable. And as any type, any time you have a series of events, it's the weakest link in the chain that ultimately will determine outcomes. 
So if we look at each individual step, which we'll see in a few slides, what you'll see is that each individual step can be defined by its own individual participants, the people involved, the data associated with each step, as well as varying technologies. So two examples are, if we look at the step of image acquisition, you have two principal participants. You have the technologist who's acquiring the image and the patient on who the image is being acquired. You have the data point being the imaging data set and the acquisition device being the modality, which could be CT or MRI. If we look at another step, such as the step of reporting, the primary participant is the radiologist, the data point is the imaging report, and the technology could either be the PACS or the reporting system. But it's important to note that when we talk about a 16-step chain of events, that there are a number of interaction effects that occur between these steps, which ultimately will impact outcomes. So as an example, if I, as a radiologist, am being analyzed for my interpretation and the accuracy of my report, it's not just based on me and my abilities alone, but I'm also affected by preceding events, such as image acquisition. If the technologist provides me with a poor quality image during the step of image acquisition, that could have a profound effect on my ability to render diagnostic accuracy in my radiology report. Next slide. So this is the 16-step imaging chain, which I basically have described. And as I said before, it begins with exam ordering and ends with the communication of results. But there's a series of intervening steps that basically always transcend in the radiology practice. And you go from the ordering of the exam, the scheduling, the, the accessing of ordering data and patient preparation prior to the exam being performed, optimizing the specific protocol, acquiring the image, processing that data, Quality assurance, which is an important step in itself, where the technologist or supervisor is tasked with reviewing the imaging data set, making sure that it's of sufficient image quality, the transfer and storage of the imaging data, the distribution and retrieval at the time of interpretation, the ability to extract historical imaging data, prior imaging studies, prior reports, the review of the image, the analysis of the image, and a really important step that's taking on greater importance of decision support, now that we have things like artificial intelligence, neural networks, deep learning. And then you also have clinical data extraction, which is where we basically want to correlate available clinical data from the electronic medical record with the imaging data to render an effective diagnosis. And then what we do is we take all of the data combined, we render a collective interpretation, we create the radiology report, and we eventually communicate those and potentially consult with the referring physician. Next slide. So what I'm going to propose to you today is that we want to create a series of well-defined metrics. And the metrics will basically be attributable to each individual step and ultimately be used to define outcomes. Now, what we want to do is we want to basically set a series of recommendations for how to actually define these metrics. The first thing is we want them to be objective, not subjective. We want them to be reproducible. And most importantly, we want them to be standardized. And the standardized portion is really, really important because if we're going to create large databases and do big data analytics, we have to use standardized data. And this, by standardizing the data, it provides the ability for us to combine, contrast, and compare data from multiple providers and multiple technologies. So it's the whole idea of basically metadata analysis. I could literally, by using standardized data, compare the, the metrics, the quality metrics, from one hospital with another hospital in another state. And what we want to do is take this metadata, combine large data aggregates, and populate and create large referenceable databases in order to derive standardized analytics. And it's these analytics which basically can be used to define outcomes, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. But more importantly, when we do this, we have to take into account the unique differences that exist between individual patients, technology, and staff as well, in order to make sure that we have a fair and equal performance metric in our analysis. Next slide. So as I mentioned before, we want to have a number of different outcomes measures. Uh, you know, if we want to basically make this uh, comprehensive, we want to look at quality. We want to look at cost. As Jimmy said earlier, cost is basically a big driver uh, amongst the payer communities. We want to look at patient safety. And we also want to look at timeliness. 
Uh, examples of um, different metrics for quality could be image quality, the appropriateness of the exam, the diagnostic accuracy of the report, examples of cost-related metrics, the technical exam cost, the professional exam cost, and the procedural cost, example of safety-related metrics, radiation dose, uh, safety metrics related to administration of contrast, as well as potentially iatrogenic complications, not only from the imaging studies themselves, but also procedures. Uh, defining metrics for timeliness, uh, this is things that we're all familiar with because we've been utilizing those for a number of years, things like examination performance time, scheduling time, and report turnaround time. Next slide. So now I want to talk a little bit about the hidden costs, because when we, when we define these metrics, we, what I've been talking about up to now are what I call primary performance metrics, things like cost and quality and safety. Those are the, basically the principal metrics that people always talk about. But there's also some secondary metrics, which I would contend are equally important in the overall analysis and frequently overlooked, but do nonetheless have a very profound impact on overall performance analysis. And what I'm going to use to illustrate this today is the radiology report, because historically, that's always been the primary means in which radiology consumers judge overall performance. Now, if we were to analyze the important step of report creation, and we go back to our 16-step chain, that was step number 15, a number of these secondary metrics can be derived, which collectively account for what I consider to be hidden costs. And examples of these are language of uncertainty, uh, follow-up recommendations, and incompleteness in the report. And for language of uncertainty, we've always talked for years about radiologists tending to hedge or equivocate in a report, and we recognize that that creates a, a tremendous amount of trepidation on the part of the referring physicians because they don't know what to do with this uncertainty language. And we have a lot of powerful technologies today in order to extract this data in the form of natural language processing software, which can actually extract uh, uh, language and, and um, content from the radiology report for analysis. We'll talk a little bit about follow-up recommendations, uh, and we'll also talk a little bit about the creation of reporting standards, which are in existence, but when not followed, can actually add to a hidden cost. Next slide. Now, report uncertainty is something we've all experienced. We've all experienced situations where a radiologist says, Something could be the case, or they can't exclude something, or it could be this, it could be that. And what that leads to is a lot of equivocation and uncertainty, not only on the part of the radiologist, but the referring physician who has to make a clinical decision on what to do with that data. Radiology re report uncertainty can also be associated with incorrect diagnosis and a lack of diagnostic confidence. But one of the hidden costs that are really, really big is oftentimes when a radiologist describes something in uncertain terms, they very frequently will recommend something as a follow-up. It could be another imaging test. So if they have a chest X-ray, they might recommend a chest CT. They might recommend a clinical test. They might recommend an interventional procedure like a bronchoscopy, or they might recommend a consultation like a pulmonary consultation. But the important thing is, because they've introduced uncertainty and equivocation report, they oftentimes basically will recommend something else to follow, and that something else comes at a significant cost. It could be a financial cost because there's more dollars involved. It could be a delay in the timeliness that you can achieve diagnosis and treatment. It could be increasing morbidity due to the time delay. You can prolong a hospital stay. You can increase the utilization of medical and clinical services. And in the case of a follow-up imaging study, oftentimes these come with increased radiation as well as the potential for iatrogenic complications. Next slide. So when we think about the hidden costs associated with report uncertainty, we have to realize that there are a lot of downstream effects associated with it. We talked about the timeliness. Anytime you basically are recommending additional follow-up, that comes with intrinsic delay, both in diagnosis and in treatment. It can increase the patient morbidity. It can increase the length of hospitalization. There's safety ramifications. When every time you, you recommend another procedure or a test, oftentimes that can lead to some type of interventional procedure or exam, which can lead to increased radiation and iatrogenic complications. And there's always going to be cost. You've recommended additional tests of some form or another, that's going to come at cost, whether it's 
in the form of the procedures, the exams, prolonged treatment, or progressive morbidity of the part of the patient's illness. Next slide. So I want to talk a little about systemic factors influencing report uncertainty and follow-up recommendations. It's really easy to basically blame it on the radiologist and say, oh, this silly radiologist, they can never make up their mind or always giving me these equivocal reports. But in reality, while some uncertainty may be attributable to the individual radiologist, it could also be due to a number of systemic factors associated with that imaging chain I talked about. And we talk a little bit about upstream and downstream factors. And if we go back to that 16-step imaging chain, we can identify a series of individual steps prior to the radiology report, all of which could be contributing to the uncertainty, and as a result of that, increase in follow-up recommendations. Next slide, please. So here we go back to that 16-step imaging chain, and I just wanted to highlight some of the steps in the imaging chain, which oftentimes have interaction effects with the report interpretation and can be contributing factors to uncertainty. There's the exam ordering, there's the protocol optimization, there's the image acquisition and processing, there's the process of quality control, quality assurance, the transfer of the data in the storage, historical imaging data extraction, as well as clinical data extraction. Next slide. Oh, I think we go back one more, please. There we go. Okay, so if we go back to these steps that I highlighted, if we talk about exam ordering, if one basically selects an incorrect or suboptimal exam, oftentimes that can lead to uncertainty. If you basically, if the technologist basically utilizes a suboptimal protocol for optimization, that can lead to uncertainty. So can poor image quality, so can the inability to present the radiologist with appropriate clinical data, as well as imaging data. And the other thing we have to remember is that each step of the imaging chain has its own associated technologies with that. And technologies are not fail-proof. So anytime you have a problem with the technology itself, whether it be the acquisition device, the image processing software, the order entry system, the risk of the packs, any type of mechanical malfunction can ultimately adversely affect quality and lead to not only report uncertainty, but increased follow-up recommendations. Next slide. So I'm going to give you a practical example. And this is something that I, as a teleradiologist, experience all the time. Typically what happens when I get an abdominal CT, the entire clinical indication I'm presenting with is abdominal pain. So in this particular case, we're going to take a 10-year-old child who comes in with abdom nonspecific abdominal pain for abdominal CT. The radiology report renders the following statement. Non-visualization of the appendix without localized right lower quadrant inflammatory change. Unfortunately, the patient did have appendicitis. It went undiagnosed, and as a result of that, the appendix perforated, resulting in prolonged hospitalization and a lot of morbidity. So what I really want to be able to show you today is that it wasn't just the fact that a radiologist missed a finding or was uncertainty. It was the fact that a number of preceding events in this chain were contributing factors. First off, it was insufficient clinical history. If the history had specified that the symptoms were referable to the right lower quadrant and the clinical diagnosis of appendicitis was a concern, then that would have probably had a significant effect on the interpretation. At the same time, the lack of order entry data specifying the area of concern resulted in a suboptimal protocol to visualize the appendix. And maybe in this particular case, the technologist only acquired the images in a single axial plane. If they knew they were looking for appendicitis, a diligent uh, technologist would basically create coronal reconstructions to improve the visualization. And then the last step is, if the technologist reviewing the imaging data prior to exam completion had reviewed the data set in detail, they might have picked up the fact that the appendix was not well visualized and they needed to do additional imaging. Next step. Next slide, please. So what I want to propose to you today is if we were to create a series of these metrics, if we were to track data specific to each individual step, commingle this data, and create a large referenceable database, we would have the opportunity to create a large number of outcomes analyses related to quality, safety, cost analysis, and operational efficiency. 
And there's a number of examples of how we can actually utilize this data to improve performance. In the exam ordering step, we can use existing exam appropriateness criteria and correlate that with things like the clinical context, why the exam was being done, the individual patient attributes, as well as the performance of the individual technology. We can look at exam scheduling, look and find whether the provider selection was appropriate based on the historical backlogs and scheduling time. We can look at the ability to optimize protocols most uh, appropriately based not only on the clinical indication, the individual patient attributes, as well as radiation risk profiles. And we can start to do things like look at alternative technologies, computerized algorithms to actually objectively analyze image quality at the point of care. Uh, I know we're running out of time, so unfortunately I'm going to speed up a little bit. Uh, we can look at the decision support and look for customized decision support tools to enhance the diagnosis. And we can actually look at the reports themselves, as we said before, using tools such as natural language processing to identify excessive use of uncertainty language, FOB recommendations, and incompleteness in the report content. Next slide. So while there are a number of different stakeholder perspectives, the referring physician, the patient, a payer, a uh, medical malpractice insurer and administrator, one thing we can say is everybody has certain things in common. They all want to optimize quality, safety, timeliness, and cost. And the creation of these objective metrics and standardized data analysis can basically help assist in identifying best practice and in optimizing the selection of the provider. Next slide. Technology is really important. While all of medicine basically utilizes technology, I think imaging is unique and that's 100% driven by technology. This places heightened importance on data-driven decision-making related to not only technology selection, but upgrades, as Jimmy alluded to in his earlier talk, the cost analysis, as well as the implementation. So the database can not only be used to evaluate provider performance, but also technology performance and also identify opportunities for technology refinement and innovation. Next slide. So in conclusion, the creation of objective quality metrics and analysis in medical imaging provides an opportunity for imaging providers to enhance performance and improve patient outcomes. And these outcomes analysis should be based on a combination of quality, safety, timeliness, and cost. In the current era of patient empowerment and big data, those providers who can proactively embrace this change will, will create a competitive advantage. And RADSITE believes that we, as an, as an entity, can play a constructive role in the transformation process and provide assistance to you as imaging providers in the efforts to continuously improve patient outcomes. So sorry to go over, but that's the conclusion of my talk. Well, Dr. Reiner, thank you so much. Wow, what a webinar. We are a little bit over over time, so I'm going to be respectful of people's times, and we'll be happy to uh, process um, you know, any questions directly. Uh, feel free to email us um, if you're interested. Um, but you know, obviously, just to recap, we start off with Mr. Long, who talked a little bit about uh, the rich payer perspective over the past couple of decades and creating, creating quality and effectiveness criteria for imaging networks uh, that also look after not only the payer but provider and the patient. <clears throat> Dr. Siegel talked a little bit about um, the uh, virtual reality and augmented reality and all the innovation and how you know, the practice of uh, imaging is just changing literally on a weekly basis. And of course, Dr. Reiner um, rounded things up with really giving us a multi-dimensional perspective of how dynamic uh, quality benchmarking uh, can be. Uh, and the challenge, of course, is moving from the general accreditation benchmarks today to looking at his 16 steps, he used example the radiology report and really how do we move to a real, uh, more real-time outcomes um, scenario. So I think it's just uh, been a fantastic webinar. Um, come see us at the, uh, if you're going to RSNA, come see us at RAD site at booth 3253. Um, Dr. Siegel will be there, I'll be there, and some other staff of uh, booth 3253. And this webinar will be available uh, online uh, probably within a week if you want to re-listen to it. And this is all about community. RATSITE is about forming communities. We want to uh, initiate discussions with you. We want um, you. We want to hear your feedback. Um, this easily could have been its own, you know, three different webinars. But I think we squeezed a lot in today to just really 
initiate the discussion. Uh, stay tuned. RAPSIDE, I think, is going to be uh, engaged in some very exciting uh, projects going into 2019. So uh, stay on our website and we'll keep you updated. So, Julie, any final um, comments as we wrap up the webinar today? No, sir, I don't have any. I want to thank each of the speakers, Mr. Long, Dr. Siegel, Dr. Reiner. Thank you so much for your time. Everybody uh, online, thank you for joining us. Have a great week, and we'll be talking to you soon. Thanks. Uh, this concludes Thanks. today's webinar.